So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining me. It's great to have you on board. And uh, quite frankly, I think it's absolutely critical uh, that we share as much information as we can at this juncture. Now, the reason I wanted to actually do this session now, today, um, is simply because of the fact that we know that this evening we're going to get a lot of information from the president and that that information is definitely going to uh, impact on us and our planning. And uh, I think we need to look at that planning uh, from the perspective of our businesses. My name is Ivor Blumenthal, and uh, my organization is called ARC Consult. I am the uh, chief executive officer uh, of uh, ARC Consult. Uh, I want to look at what you've already seen by now, and you should be quite familiar with, uh, but there are some people I know who haven't been able to access the presentation. So I'm going to take the liberty of going through it just insofar as it should be impacting on what we are trying to cover today. I needn't tell you by now because you should all be aware of the fact that we are going to divide alerts into five levels in one way or another. I have seen a meme going around suggesting that there will only be three levels. Um, my understanding is from the presidential uh, advisory team that this risk-adjusted strategy has been accepted by cabinet in terms of the classification of the various businesses, not necessarily in terms of the application um, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, no, I misspoke, not of the businesses. This is a, an alert system uh, based on either classifying the country as a whole or classifying parts of the country in different ways. So the, the point that I'm making is, my information is that there will indeed be a five level of classification. Um, not all five levels will obviously apply uh, uh, at any one moment in time. And very, very importantly, the modeling that has been done is one that's suggesting that with more testing, and we know that the, the, the target number of tests a day is 45,000 here in South, uh, sorry, is 25,000 in South Africa. So we are aiming for 25,000 tests a day. We've done roughly about 160,000 tests in total across the country out of 58 odd million people. So we've got a long way to go to do 25 and then 45,000, which is the ultimate uh, target today. Remembering ladies and gentlemen, that the problem is not the number of tests that are done, but is the capacity of our various laboratories to analyze those tests. The irony is that the analytical equipment um, to be able to analyze those tests um, at this moment in time uh, on a global level is in very short supply, and every single country around the world is basically batting for that same equipment. And the same, to some extent or another, the same goes for ventilators, et cetera, et cetera, and certainly PPE. But the point that I'm making here is that our target at the moment is 25,000 a day. We're not anywhere close to 25,000 a day of tests which are being analyzed and being processed. Um, we have uh, roughly, let's say, 200,000 that have been done so far for South Africa as a whole. Our modeling on the impact of contracting the virus and our modeling on the impact of, unfortunately, deaths that result from the virus contracting only deaths which result from the people who've been tested. And then more importantly, the number of people who are being cured. That entire modeling system at the moment is being based on a sample of 200,000 out of 58 million. So as you can hear and as you can see, these levels will vary very much according to how we manage to get the number of tests processed increased uh, on a daily basis. Um, you will have seen, for example, in the United Kingdom that they um, underestimated. So the statistical analysis sampling was something like 44% wrong in terms of their under uh, uh, analyzing and under incorporating um, the number of deaths in their country. So every country is making mistakes at this moment in time, but we're learning. And I must say, we are the leading country in the world, and I say that without any thoughts of, of, of uh, immodesty, but we're the leading country in the world when it comes to epidemiologically dealing with viruses, because we've dealt with Ebola, we've dealt with MERS, we've dealt with SARS, et cetera, et cetera. We have an amazing epidemi epidemiological team in South Africa, 
uh, spread across the country, and I'm sure you've been hearing from them. And what they're saying is this, the more people we test, the more that these five levels will jump and will move on a provincial basis and on a national basis for us. So nothing is set in concrete. And I think that that's absolutely, uh, absolutely critical, ladies and gentlemen. Um, these the proposals which come out of this risk-adjusted strategy, and this is absolutely critical, please, for you to consider. The proposals are based not so much on the incidence of infections in the provinces, but will eventually be based on the incidence of asymptomatic contraction of the virus contracting of the virus, contraction is the wrong word, contracting of the virus. So the success of our being able to forecast what we are doing with our level determination and with, in fact, releasing lockdowns is very much going to be the ba based on how asymptomatic people in a particular area or region are going to prove to be. And why is that important? Because it means, ladies and gentlemen, that those people will be able to carry the virus without succumbing to the virus, which means that their natural antibodies will have been built up. And more importantly, potentially, it means that a vaccination stands a better chance of taking hold. So I think that's absolutely critical. We are eventually going to be modeling, not so much on the number of people who have contracted the virus, but the number of people who are asymptomatic. In other words, they're not getting sick despite having contracted that virus. And I think that that's an absolutely critical consideration you all please um, have, to, uh, have to bear in mind. Okay, so um, moving on then. Uh, so let's start at the, and you've seen this slide. So you know that the worst level to be applied, um, either on a region or a town or a city, but the, the worst level to be applied is this one, which is level five, which is the high virus spread uh, and the low health system readiness. And I will talk about health system readiness in a while because that is one of the three factors which is going to determine in which areas lockdown um, on particular industries is, is going to be affected first. So you can see here that the only sectors in a level five, uh, in a level five area that are going to be allowed to be uh, uh, operating are essential services. Um, the worst kind of level is the level five. We're currently, a lockdown is a level five. Um, critically important, you can see that any travel and any transport is only for purposes of transporting people in essential services. No people are allowed to move between provinces. So if the people who work for you have gone home to another province, they're not going to be allowed back into this province, which is currently the case under lockdown. Um, and goods to some extent and exceptional circumstances to some extent, for example, funerals. That is how we are currently operating as a level five uh, a nation, as a level five nation. Level four, on the other hand, is moderate. And level four says a moderate to a high virus spread with moderate readiness. And there you can see we've already, we've already moved the country into elements of level four um, sectors being permitted. So at the moment, we're bridging five to four, and you can see from food retail stores um, may sell full lines of product with existing stock, agriculture, um, forestry, mining, uh, financial and professional services, global business services, postal and telecommunication, fiber optic and IT, formal waste recycling. So you can see from a sector permission perspective, we're operating at a level four. However, you can see equally, uh, 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 we are a level five country in lockdown at this moment in time. Uh, again, no interprovincial movement, transportation of goods and exceptional circumstances. Now, when we talk about your businesses, it's critically important that you, 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 your business analysis, and you must all do a business analysis, and you must try and communicate that business analysis both to your clients as well as your customers. But that business analysis, ladies and gentlemen, has to be done on the basis, not only of the fact that you might be entitled to work as a business, and your employees might be entitled to come and work for you in that business in terms of sectors being permitted, but critically important, you have to factor in how are your employees going to get to you? How are your customers going to get to you? And importantly, how is your product and your stock going to get to you? Particularly when you consider that even if 
stock and product is allowed to move from province to province, imports themselves because of internal flights into South Africa uh, and, and, and ships docking at our docks might in fact be restricted. Now that is heavily impactful on your, on your supply chain within your business. And it is very, very definitely a factor that you need to, uh, you need, you need to be taking into account. I just want to read a comment here from Ivan that says the recovery uh, to contra uh, contractions and deaths to contraction uh, relationship is critically important uh, to opening or relaxing lockdown. It's critically important to opening and relaxing lockdown. No question about that, Ivan. Thanks for that comment. Okay, level three, moderate. Again here, we have the opening of for example, the deeds office and other government services. Now, at the moment, the entire property sector, for example, uh, is in lockdown because even if I buy a property or sell a property, I cannot register that sale or that purchase. And more importantly, when it comes to anything to do with trusts, when, he, when it comes to anything to do with needing court facilities, absolutely on lockdown, on lockdown inaccessible. Now, you can see that what people in those industries so, for example, the conveyancing sector, the property sector, the legal fraternity, what they're going to be hanging on with bated breath this evening to hear about is whether or not, and we might not hear it this evening, but whether or not um, uh, we are a level three, two, or a one. Because a level three, two, or a one, ladies and gentlemen, will automatically imply that they can go back to work. However, it might very well be that exactly what is currently the case where we are a level five as a country on lockdown, but the level four sector permission uh, 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 applies, it might very well be that if we go into a, a level four uh, on, on lockdown, so we have a certain number of industries that can be revived, it might very well be that from a sector permission perspective, we end up with a level three uh, being phased in quite quickly. Uh, there's no question that there's significant pressure on the president for a sector three, two, or a one, um, a, a phasing in of industries. There's no questions about that. The, here is a very big one in terms of sector three that doesn't apply to sector two, and that is that as far as food is concerned, hot food, takeaway restaurants, and online food deliveries uh, can, uh, well, specifically hot food, uh, liquor, uh, the kinds of things that at the moment open hardware stores, but to all uh, households and not just essential services, those will start to apply. So look for the level being level three to be able to say, if my business is in a level three, two, or a, a level three, a level four, or a level five category, I can plan to operate as soon as lockdown is in fact lifted. Critically important. Um, I, I know that there are some business associations that through the National Economic Development and Labor Council have already had discussions uh, through NEDLAC with the president's office. And so they already know if their industries are going to be relieved and uh, whether they're going to be level uh, three or level four in terms of declaration. Um, uh, Derek says, uh, will these levels also be applied provincially, not just the countrywide? Derek, you'll see what I'm going to be telling you now because these levels will be applied on a provincial basis. Uh, you, some of you might have seen this morning's article in the Business Day. And in that article, you will see how they've actually broken down the various infection and death rates um, uh, across all of the provinces. And that being one of the uh, three factors determining where lockdown is going to be lifted, you will then see the opportunity for government to say that there will be some areas, possibly even provinces, that could be classified as a level two or a three, whereas other areas might be classified as a level three or a level four or worse still, even a level five. Um, Someone asked me the question, and remember, I'm not Methuselah. I'm not even uh, Daniel Silk, to be honest, or Clem Santner. Uh, but certainly someone asked me the question, what do I think is going to happen in, in Gauteng? And I said, just look at the map. Look at the statistics, um, because Stats SA just released a ma another map this morning. But if you look at that, there's no doubt that it's Gauteng, it's KZN, and it's Western Cape that, in fact, are going to be um, left behind in the, in the declaration um, of uh, one, two, three, and maybe even four alerts in the country. And what you have to read with that, and there's no question about it, we ended up going from 3,000 military personnel on our roads to 70,000 military personnel on our roads in the last two days. Um, 
And importantly, those 70,000 military personnel are going to hang around until essentially July. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to interpret what that means. What that means is that if there is a provincial distinction between Gauteng as opposed to Limpopo, you can be certain that the vast majority of those 30,000 are going to be looking at Gauteng, KZN, and the Western Cape. And why are they going to be positioned there to keep law and to keep order when people in the country say, I live in Alex, why should I have to remain locked down when the people who live in uh, somewhere in Limpopo, somewhere in the Northern Cape, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are already out on the street. They're able to go for walks. They're able to go to their businesses, etc. That's unfair. I'm going to leave, Alex. I'm going to riot. I'm going to move into the urban areas. I need to go find work. I'm starving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, by the way, is another reason that two days ago the president announced the 500 billion rand uh, 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 assistance package. He did announce because it's. Those incentives, I'm going to get now 300 rand for food a, a, a month, plus the fact that from a stick perspective, there are 70,000 uh, South African National Defense Force troops out there, only two trigger happy to take pot shots at me whenever they can. Those two factors, the carrot and the stick working together, are going to be factors which cause me to possibly be incentivized to remain under lockdown uh, for a hopefully a slightly longer period because I am in a level four area as opposed to a level two or a level three area. So critically important, Derek, in answer to your question, I anticipate you're going to have to see a provincial distinction and maybe even a citywide uh, distinction uh, in each province as well or in some of the provinces. Certainly, I know that the provincial governments are scrambling since they got this document uh, together with Stats SA and the National uh, Institute for Virology to try and draw a city-by-city city map in their provinces because they do have permission from the presidency to present a city-by-city city map and therefore to vary. So it might very well be that even if we're told, for example, that the Western Cape is a level four, it might very well be that Alan Wendy, I think his name is the premier of the Western Cape, uh, has got a, a, a document that says we will accept a range of three to five for you as long as you're able to take your cities and distinguish which cities uh, in terms of the three criteria, which cities in fact are going to be level three, which are four and which are five. And you are able with the help of the National Defense Force in the Western Cape to in fact manage that distinction from city to city. There are some provinces that just do not have the capacity or the competency to manage something that complicated. And we know those provinces, some of them are under administration. Uh, some of them have members uh, of our cabinet at the moment who moved out of provincial premierships into cabinet because they were uh, less than competent at the time. Um, so we know which provinces are going to struggle on to differentiate their um, uh, alert levels from city to city. But we also, I think, equally know um, that Le Sufi uh, in, the, in, in Gauteng, uh, that Wendy, uh, Wendy in, in the Western Cape will have the capacity to, in fact, do that kind of differential diagnosis or differential classification of cities on a provincial by, by provincial basis. So it's critically important. Level two. Level two is the level that the construction sector the manufacturing sector um, uh, and the steel sector are all looking for. Because if you happen to have a factory in a level two area, you'll be able to go back to work. You'll be able to become fully functional insofar as your businesses are concerned. If you can convince both your workers, your workforce to come back to work on the one hand, and if you can convince um, your um, uh, customers to come back. I just want to pause for a second, ladies and gentlemen, and say this to you. That the UIF temporary employee relief scheme is going to be very much linked to level four and level five um, uh, uh, classified areas. Uh, which means that, as you know, the UIFTR scheme has they have made allowance for it to be extended until the end of June, in other words, for three months, and they have reserved the right to extend it beyond the end of June anyway. But what you need to know is if you fall within a permitted sector in either a level two um, uh, or a level three or 
in, in a level two or a level three. Not so much where we are at the moment in a four or a five, but in a level two or in a level three. That the lockdown provision will no longer apply to you, might apply to some industries in your sector. So the TER scheme will become differential on the basis of industries which they apply to, number one. And they'll also become differential on the basis of uh, what um, level has been applied to where you operate from. If they have the capacity, if they have the capacity, in fact, to become that sophisticated is a critically important uh, consideration if they have the capacity. In other words, if the development team sitting in India, because we know that that's where the UIFTR system is being developed, if that development team sitting in India has the capacity to differentiate between industries, number one, for TR to be applied, and provinces, number two, and maybe even cities and towns, then the UIFTR system will become responsive. Otherwise, there'll just be a lot of email processing by the call center here in Gauteng uh, that when you get through to, will say, sorry, we have to refer, refer it on up the chain. Okay, so that's absolutely critically important that you understand that TR will run along with the level of classification. It will not. I had a question this morning from someone who said, did I think that lockdown will be suspended at the end of April? And if it's suspended, even partially at the end of April, TR system will disappear. No, the TR system will not disappear. It will continue at least for the next two months to apply wherever lockdown still applies, even if it's only on a provincial basis, even if it's only, by the way, on a city basis, it will apply there. But what's critically important for you to understand is that it's with a level two, it's with a level two that the people who work in your homes, your cleaners, your gardeners, the, your domestic workers can come back to work. Now, this is critically important as well, because the reality is here, it is here where on a social basis, we're going to have a mixing of different herds. And when I say herds, that's the medical term, because the herd is the people with whom you have been cloistered for the last four weeks. That's your herd. Now, suddenly with the introduction of another herd, you have a impregnation of one herd into another herd. You have the potential for either an outbreak or an asymptomatic outbreak, either an outbreak of contagion with people getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and that's what's happened around the world, or alternatively, an outbreak of asymptomatic contagion, which is desirable, because asymptomatic contagion means that if I happen to have physical contact with the lady who happens to clean my house in any way whatsoever, and so I contract from her, or if she contracts from me, because maybe I went overseas and brought the virus back into my household, I'm just using these as examples, but if there is a contamination, a cross-contamination between one herd and the other, what we're hoping, and this is what happened previously with um, SARS, it happened with MERS, is that with that herd intermingling comes a better herd hardiness and importantly, asymptomatic contraction. And that's a mature development of this virus to the extent that we know we can survive, we know we can live. It's what's starting to happen in New York. And you, you would have heard Governor Cuomo um, talk about it last night in his interview with his brother, by the way, whose wife is still sick. Okay, so moving on. Critically important that you notice that under level two is where we have that, that herd uh, mixing and mingling. Those waste pickers, the guys who come and they pick at your rubbish bins outside your house before the, rub before the rubbish bin teams get there, those are the guys who bring in a third herd. Now, this is a transversal herd. It's a herd which might live in your parks, not in your household, um, but in an environment where there's absolutely no testing, but there's also no control of the spread of the virus. But you will have seen that that, that particular herd is hardy enough to massively have a higher um, asymptomatic factor, which means they're running around with the virus, but they're not themselves getting sick from the virus, which is where you and I and everybody um, who is not in that particular herd ideally wants to get. Uh, I heard an interview with an epidemiologist who said that that factor of asymptomatic contraction will be highest, and it's simply a, a guess because there's no facts at the moment, but will be highest in that particular group of people because of their lifestyle, not chosen lifestyle, but because of their uh, lifestyle. 
critically important. We see here that all government services also under level two, although it is also, I think, under partially under level three, will go back to work. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go with a joke I heard this morning about that. Okay, moving on. Now, very important from a business perspective, ladies and gentlemen, is you have to factor this into your consideration. Domestic air travel is restored. Now, that's good because that also means domestic rail travel will be restored. Um, it will also mean uh, that domestic um, car rental services can be restored. That's for you to go from Joburg to Durban or Joburg to Cape Town. That's fantastic. But what you don't see here is international restrictions being lifted. In fact, in none of these, even level one, it, oh, sorry, you do see it in level one, all modes of tra transport um, uh, will be uh, allowed to operate. But from level two to three to four to five, you do not see transport restrictions being lifted. Now, the critically important factor for your businesses is that if you depend on air freight, you've got a problem there and you might be restricted to sea freight. And importantly, it might also be that what our Minister of Transport, um, uh, uh, our Minister of Taxi Services, um, uh, will get right is to look at a hybrid level two, level one um, release as far as transport restrictions are concerned, international transport restrictions are concerned. Um, and, and certainly there was discussion last week at NEDLAC on exactly this issue, that certainly the air cargo, but even the the uh, uh, um, uh, human travel uh, needs to be restricted from a level two upwards. But the task team has said that can only happen from a level one upwards. Uh, Everett Bolt uh, asks me, um, where can we find the SA stats information you mentioned? Everett, um, once this, um, once this uh, webinar is loaded, I will attach to it um, both the original uh, 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 risk-adjusted strategy, again, even though we've sent it out, I'll also attach to it the stats essay um, review on the business, uh, uh, on the current business climate and the impact on the business uh, environment as well. So thank you for that question. Um, all right, so that's level two. And level one is obvious. All sectors being permitted, all modes of transport being permitted, uh, and basically we're back to, to, back to where we want to be. Um, I need to disabuse anybody on this webinar at the moment by saying this. Do not imagine that in the course of this year, we will see a level one classification anywhere in the country because that level one classification is going to be dependent on a percentage of our um, uh, 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 population having been tested. It's going to be dependent on the factor of um, uh, uh, asymptomatic uh, cont uh, contracting being established, and importantly, it's going to be dependent on the availability of a virus uh, on a vaccination as well. And we know um, because uh, certainly we've heard it from the states, we've heard it from Italy, and we've also heard it from Israel, where a lot of the development is being done. We know that we are at least another eight months away from a full-scale implementation of a vaccination strategy around the world. But equally, we know that if you think there's been a problem with access to ventilators, if you think there's been a problem with access to the equipment that does the analyzing of the tests that have been taken, then you're going to have another thing coming when it comes, or thought coming, when it comes to access to any vaccinations which have been passed by um, uh, the American health authorities or the health authorities within Europe or anywhere else in the world. There is going to be a huge rush for those vaccinations. We are going to stand in line. Yes, money is going to talk, but remember that there are a lot of end of the year elections coming on, particularly in North America. And as a result, um, the country that can secure those vaccinations or the politician that can secure that vaccination first or the majority of what's available first is in fact going to be a very popular politician. And we know for a fact that uh, there has been talk. Uh, that's totally, that's contradictory. We know for a fact that there's been talk, but we know that there's been talk that uh, even previously there were attempts by uh, American officials to in fact buy up entire loads of testing for, uh, uh, um, facilities and consumables, let alone vaccinations. So that's going on around the world as we speak. And even though we are recognized as a leading country in how we've been dealing with this problem, we are not recognized as a leading customer 
when it comes to being able to buy product, unless of course it's going to be from China that just lent us 315 billion rand um, so that uh, our president could put 500 billion rand into the market. Um, uh, 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 it might be that we are able to buy um, manufactured product from China, but I don't know if I want to trust vaccinations coming from China. Um, Evert says we know there's a plan for schools, uh, for school down to grade R. What about creches, etc., looking after kids or parents who, who have to go back to work? Evert, I don't have an answer for you um, uh, because the bottom line is I think just as schools um, are out at least until, let's say, June, uh, I'd imagine that any facility such as a creche would equally be out for exactly the same reason, which is social contamination um, and the inability for social distancing to take place. However, having said that, all sorts of really weird and wonderful things might happen tonight, and um, not just tonight. I don't anticipate the whole plan will be released or revealed tonight, but certainly maybe released, um, uh, some of it will be released and revealed tonight. But I mean, I think it's just logical that what you have to follow what's going on in the schools to understand what's going on in the creches. And it's also logical then as employers to assume that if someone who works for you has three children at home, by asking that person to come back to work in a scenario where creches can't be operating, where schools are not operating, you are possibly asking your employee to make an impossible choice. Now, the problem you've got is if that person is a blue collar worker and doesn't work, can't work from home, can't work remotely because you need them in a factory or on a production line, you have a major problem on your hands that you have to be allocating some kind of a risk alleviation strategy to on the one hand. On the other hand, you're going to have a scenario where the temporary employment relief scheme is going to say to you, you're in a category, you're at a level in a category in an industry that isn't locked down. And so as a result, we're not going to make TR available to you. So you're not going to have that 60 to 38% subsidy of salaries for your business to be able to carry you with what you have to pay those people, even though they're staying at home. So you have a hell of a predicament uh, uh, on your hands in terms of, as a business, how you're going to plan for manpower. Um, many businesses are starting to say, we've got no option then. We're going to have to imagine ourselves capitalizing, which means bringing equipment into the workplace as labor replacement because we cannot get the right number of people or the right level of skills to come into our business because of their own personal problems, their own personal challenges. We need production to commence. Therefore, we're going to have to capitalize if equipment is available. And importantly, if the suppliers of that equipment get essential services certificates from the Department of Trade and Industry. Now is the time for forecasters such as a Daniel Silk or uh, all of these guys who think they know what the future is holding. But now is the time for them to say, let's look at the labor capital equation in South Africa. Is the coronavirus going to force, going to force, force, force capitalization at a rate South Africa is just not going to manage to keep up with without a living wage subsidy being paid by government, which is what Gates and what um, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk have been asking for for years now. Pay your people to stay at home because our technology is going to force them to be out of a job. Well, it might be coronavirus now forcing them to be out of a job. But the question is, are we going to see the equivalent of a dole here in South Africa? Certainly, we have a ANC SACP Casato alliance where the SACP philosophy completely outweighs any capitalist uh, ANC philosophy. So we stand a very good chance of being the first country in Africa to implement a formal uh, a dole on an ongoing basis to pay people to stay at home so that some of these problems can be alleviated. The real question from your business perspective is where do you get the funding for your capital equipment, even if you can get the capital equipment? Um, the only place to look, quite frankly, is business partners uh, at this moment in time uh, that uh, are rolling out and also the Industrial Development Corporation, if they're open, uh, to, to have access to, to capital equipment funding. All right. Um, as you can see, and this comes directly from the document and it's only suggestion, it, this is illustrative, but as you can see, if... These are the colors, and so let's just look at the colors. It goes from red to level three, which is yellow, to one which is green. As you can see, there are no reds which are being forecast. That's good, no level fives. Um, but as you can see, there is possibly one province there 
and that's uh, what's that province there? Uh, that's Limpopo. I'm not sure what that province is. Um, but Gauteng is that color over there, and that color over there is essentially that. That's that color, by the way, uh, that uh, Gauteng is in. So as you can see, we've got Gauteng, we've got that province over there, and I'm surprised to see that the Western Cape is immune to being the same color as Gauteng and that province over there, but that is the reality um, uh, in terms of what the statistics are currently forecasting. But as you can see then, oh, Mpumalanga, thanks so much, Aggie. You can see that I don't get into my car much. Um, uh, but as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that is what a alert classification will look like after tonight, we anticipate, unless what the president says, because I know he's taking a lot of flack this afternoon because of this document, unless what he says is, we are going to leave it up to the provinces to determine what their level is uh, after they've consulted with the National Infectious Disease uh, Laboratory or uh, department with our epidemiology team. And then we will have a national committee that uh, considers a submission from each of those nine provinces. And then we'll classify the provinces or maybe even classify the towns, villages and cities in the provinces. I'm excited to see whether courage talks tonight or uh, uh, op not opportunism, but uh, the opportunity to placate talks tonight. Um, I, I have so much... I have so much respect for our president and for our minister of health with what they're doing and trying to balance all of these books um, and balls. So I, I, yeah, they definitely have balls. Right, moving on. Um, Grant asks, how will business that teach kids fit in? Grant, um, so very good question. The obvious answer is, well, Zoom, GoToMeeting, et cetera, uh, uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, is most probably the only solution for teaching in the short term, given that it is highly unlikely. What happened in the United Kingdom, they tried to lift the ban on teaching and the teachers and the headmasters and the, the, the school SGBs themselves objected on the basis of the fact that they didn't want their kids going into an environment that they knew was not yet clear of the virus to the extent that we've already discussed here uh, on, on, on this discussion. Lee says, where do restaurants fit in? Lee? I'm going to make a throwaway statement now, but I'm going to justify it towards the end of this presentation. My answer to you is restaurants are the least priority industry of the entire 29 industries we're going to be discussing shortly. Do not anticipate that you're going to get to a normal December, January trading pattern and anticipate that if you are in the restaurant business by the end of the year, that in going into it in, in, uh, for next year, you're going to have to have completely redefined your business model in terms of capital that's available, loans that might become available, credit that might become available, um, aid which might become available from that 500 million rand, and importantly, in terms of your engagement and negotiation with your landlords. And you know that because we've had some of these discussions in the South African Independent Tenants Group. Um, but I will talk about restaurants in a little while. But thank you for those questions, guys. Okay, so I hope you all understand that we are definitely am talking about ever talking about a provincial classification, not a national classification. Okay, so there are three factors which are going to affect the lifting of the lockdown, um, and uh, those three. One of those three factors is our transmission risk rating. So 29 industries have been focused on, and those industries have been scored in terms of the transmission risk that they present. And there is a nine-point scale that every one of those 29 industries have indeed been measured against. So these are the kinds of things, the statistical analysis of those 29 industries that are currently being taken into account, and there's a national dashboard uh, in this regard. The percentage of employees who can work remotely. So a call center is most probably, well, it is um, at the lowest part of that classification system. I think it's two out of 18 um, because the majority of people who work for a call center could practically work from home. I'm just using a call center as an example. There are some call centers that are in-house and just can't. Okay. Percentage of the workforce that is older than 50. 
we have a major, major problem in South Africa that the vast majority of the manufacturing sector, which is labor and not capital intensive, in other words, where things are not made by machines and equipment, um, but in fact, things are made by hand, they're made manually. Our problem is that the vast majority, it's estimated that in excess of 70% of artisans in South Africa, the people that make things in the blue collar environment, that the majority, 70% and higher, of the people who make things in South Africa are over the age of 50, which means that in terms of transmission risk rating, that is a highly exposed sector of industries. Uh, it might be different from industry to industry, but it is certainly a factor that needs to be taken into account. The third of the nine factors is the percentage of the workforce in geographies with high transmission. In other words, high alert um, uh, classifications level four and five. So the workforce is in level four and five areas. The ability to enforce social distancing of two meters at work. God knows how they are going to analyze that uh, reliably, but that I think it's all allegorically. Um, but certainly that's what the, those 70,000 South African Defense Force personnel are there to do, I suppose. The ability to provide masks to employees, well, they've got relatively good statistics on the flow of goods from our ports um, uh, and from the limited planes coming in domestic cargo, bringing domestic cargo in. And so they at least know the provinces to which a lot of that stuff is being shipped. The ability to screen employees. So we've had 200,000 screenings in total in South Africa. It's actually about 160, but let's say 200,000. Um, we do not know. And it's going to be left up to industry bodies. And you'll see in this document, they actually say that the success of the classification system and the success of the lifting the lockdown is almost, from a business perspective, is almost exclusively going to be dependent, ladies and gentlemen, on the work done by organized business, your business associations, your business confederations. So your business associations. I am sure that you've been attending webinar after webinar after webinar of your employer associations that have been giving you all of this information, whether it's about TERS, whether it's about um, all the various incentives. I'm sure that you're sick to death of the webinars your associations have been giving you, your employer associations, your trade associations have been giving you because they, that's their job. You pay them a membership fee to bring all of this information to you. Now, they're going to be the primary mover and shaker for the business community of making these things work. And every one of those associations is going to be the go-to organization that government's um, uh, uh, infectious disease division calls on to say, we need you to have researched who of your members have, for example, got masks, who of your members have got internal screening programs, who of your members have participated in external screening programs. Larry, if you're on the line, I, I don't know if you're on the line, I haven't seen, but if you're on the line, in terms of what you're doing in testing facilities around the country, you should be doing it in partnership with business associations, and those business associations should be putting your facilities, even if on a traveling basis, um, into every one of their large size businesses, um, because that's what this this transmission risk rating nine point scale is going to be dependent on the information flowing from those companies, the ability to isolate all ill employees. So quite frankly, the only industry that I know of to date that has begun to do that is the mining sector. That's after their various CEOs are released from jail from opening prematurely. But the mining sector where they are, they've actually set up hostels, they've actually uh, converted big uh, facilities into contamination areas, they've put beds in, they've put hospital equipment in, and they've said that because we're expecting our employees to come back to work, we're also taking the risk of having to manage their infections at work. So I think that that's a very, very important uh, consideration here. Um, the ability of employees who use, sorry, the percentage of employees who use public transport. Well, um, as you know, during lockdown, there was actually a requirement on you in your business to make specific transport arrangements for the people who work in your business. 
so that they wouldn't have to use public transport. But that was a request from the president. It wasn't an imperative on essential service businesses. Um, but this is a factor that is going to weigh very, very heavily on the nine-point transmission classification of an industry. The percentage of employees who use public transport. And here again, I know many of your associations are hard at work putting in mechanisms to actually get this information uh, from your members. Tara, I look to you here in terms of both SAPMA and also the SCA, because you now have a, a national license to ask them to answer these questionnaires in such a way that you have this information to be able to provide to, to government authorities. And that goes for all of you, Brian, if you're on the line uh, as far as uh, working at height is concerned, it equally applies to you. Um, Ulti, if you're on the line. Okay. Uh, the percentage and the final factor is a percentage of employees who must cross provincial borders to start work. Major point in risk transmission. One of the reasons, for example, that KZN asked the military to stand by the toll gates going into KZN to try and stop people coming in um, uh, either for funerals or to go home during the period of the lockdown. They weren't successful, but that's why they attempted to do that. Because a herd is not only you and your family at home. A herd is not only the area or the street you live in. A herd is equally your province. So a province's herd factor, uh, uh, um, asymptomatic factor, is different to another province's asymptomatic factor, which then affects your transmission risk rating. From an industry to an industry as well, if you've got a lot of mixing of different herds amongst your blue collar employees, and then a lot of intermixing amongst your blue and your white collar uh, employees, the people who work in your factory on the one hand, as opposed to people who work in your administration offices on the other hand, you have a majorly negative uh, one ninth of this particular nine point transmission risk rating, um, which is operating in your business. Okay, I'm not going to go through them because we'll go through them in a little while. But well, actually, let me quickly tell you that there are 29 industries, they're called target industries, that that previous nine point transmission risk rating has been applied against. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. But it's these 29 industries that government have determined are our critical industries in South Africa. So it goes all the way from agriculture, food, beverages, and tobacco, all the way through to wholesale and retail, online food delivery. And these aren't in order or ranked, by the way. They're just um, the, the 29 industries. Um, so every one of these industries now has a transmission risk rating now has a transmission risk rating. And because they have that transmission risk rating, we are able, as you've seen already, we're able to say this. We're able to say that it goes from a, uh, it goes from a, it goes from a uh, nine point transmission risk rating factor of um, two for professional services all the way up to a level 18 for transport and aviation. That's why you can see we've got no planes coming into South Africa because we have an 18 score on that nine point scale. We have an 18 score for your airlines, which is massively high. If you wanted some kind of a sequential indicator of how industries are gonna be phased in after the lockdown, or how a lockdown might be, and just follow my arrows, and I'm sorry to say if you can see an error, but follow my arrows, work from the top down. You are talking from the very top, which is transport aviation here, all the way most probably down to pharmaceuticals over here. No, construction is nine. Um, all right, so let's say to construction. So if you're in construction, pharmaceuticals, um, television, communication, if you're in real estate, if you're in fleet management, wholesale and retail for clothing, wholesale and retail for food, uh, although they've made a compromise there, chemicals, fishing, manufacturing, um, coke oven, petroleum refineries, 
although that's not the best business to be in at the moment. Um, hotels, restaurants, and tourism. Lee, in answer to your question, uh, uh, hotels, restaurants, and retail takeaways, uh, recreational, cultural, sporting activities, and transport. If you're in any of those, from construction all the way up, you can virtually assume that unless there is a certain amount of alleviation, but you can virtually assume that you're going to be stuck within a level four or level five classification um, while everything from wholesale and retail online food delivery all the way down to professional services is being phased in after the end of April. So you can virtually assume that from construction upwards, with a couple of, 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 of differences, but from construction upwards, you can virtually assume that you're going to be in an extended lockdown situation. Let's say, hopefully, nothing more than 70% of what our current lockdown restrictions are. But I would not imagine anything less at the same time than 70%. And that's just the industry you're in. That's just your industry. So we're not talking about provinces or areas. That's just your industry at this moment in time. So if you happen to be in an industry or sector, which is from, from, from wholesale retail for online food and delivery downwards, all the way through to professional services, if you happen to be in that grouping over there, as a business, you have to think to yourself, what dependencies do we have on the construction all the way through to airlines upwards? Because we're going to have to, our business plan to open and to be productive for, product, for production or for offering of services is going to have to be very, very dependent on our dependencies in that closed off group up there. So when you listen to the president's announcements tonight, ladies and gentlemen, don't just listen to what industries have, are being released back into the economy, what geographic areas are being released back into the economy, but equally listen to what restrictions there are on industries and geographic areas that you as a company have dependencies on. Critically important that you do understand that factor. You have to take into account the industries and the geographic areas that you have dependencies on in your business strategy and your business planning. I know at least two companies that I was speaking with this morning that said, if this classification system is actually followed by the president, then even though I'm in uh, 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 a forestry environment, I'm not going to be able to open my business because of my dependency on these other guys up here. They're either all my clients or my only clients, uh, sometimes on an industry by industry basis. Mervyn, I don't know if you're on the line, but that's the kind of decision you would need to think about in terms of the products you supply into the printing sector. Um, it, it's all very well you could be opening, but if you can't get product because those industries are cut off, you can't bring product into the country except by ship, then, then you, the question is, should you be opening? And if you don't open, you need to acknowledge then that you might not have access to the temporary employee relief anyway. So you're going to have to either pay salaries or run the risk of losing your high value staff uh, in your business. So that's a decision making process you have to go through. Ladies and gentlemen, I, are there any questions at this stage? Let me just Ask, are there any questions? I will unmute your microphones, just giving you time to ask questions because I know I've said a lot. Arthur, what industry or what section does a independent store with less than seven staff members and doing less than 15 million rand a year? What category does he fall under? So you're retail. Um, uh, this classification has got nothing no. to do with whether you're small, medium, or, or, or large. But you're retail, so you're either wholesale and retail in food. I mean, there are a number of retail sections, or wholesale, retail in clothing, or generally wholesale and retail. Um, so you fall into one of those classifications. But that was such a good question because you might not actually find your industry here. Remember, these are 29 target industries. Some of them are sectors, which means they can be broken down into industries. But the classification is being done on these target industries. I don't know how many of you guys I've actually, especially those of you in associations that are now being worked to the bone by your members um, because of the services you're giving. But I don't know how many of you I've actually said this to before. Make sure 
that you're working with the Department of Trade and Industries to get standard industrial classification and standard well, occupational because... classification codes. Because if you don't, if there is no formal way of the Department of Trade and Industry to identify your industry or your sector, because there are no SIC codes and there are no SOC codes, then this kind of thing is likely to happen, that you are not even on the map here. So, for example, I don't see the funeral sector on this map. I might just not have found it, but I don't see the funeral sector on this map. So the bottom line is, I would say to you, um, Johan, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys haven't done a very good job in terms of sick and sock codes. And you tell me you're losing the people who are, who are burying people in graveyards. You're losing them to coronavirus. Well, there's no incentive scheme to help you either medically or in terms of PPE because government works by sick and sock codes. And if you're not on this list, you know you haven't got the right kind of sick and sock codes in place. Please, I'm not preaching. I know I'm sounding... Uh, uh, obnoxious the way I'm saying, but those of you who've worked with me for the last 10 or 15 years in terms of association building and confederation building will know that it's a mantra where I've been saying to you, you need sick and you need SOC codes. Now you can say, how, now you can see how sick and SOC codes are applied. So in answer to that last question, if you can't find yourself on the list, you have to find the category you can fit yourself into, and then you have to be able to justify to the unemployment insurance fund why you are on this list even though you don't have sick and sock codes because you have been paying UIF, you might be a member of a bargaining council, which is on the list somewhere. And so as a result, that would be the nature of your justification. But the onus would be on you to fight with the Unemployment Insurance Fund to convince them to cover you in, in that particular regard. Um, are there other questions before I carry on? I've said to you that there are three, and document has told you as well, so I'll just very quickly uh, uh, go over it. I've said to you that um, if government takes a sectoral approach to lifting the lockdown, then these are the three factors that are going to affect the sectoral approach. The first is transmission of risk. In fact, it's number two here. But that is transmission of risk is that factor over there, and it's that final number over there. So number two is that number, the transmission of risk. So um, Expected impact on the sector of continued lockdown, including the prior vulnerability. The vulnerability is a transmission of risk factor. The first factor, the most important factor that government is going to have to apply, is the economic value at risk. Sectoral contribution to gross domestic product, employment, export earning potential that's being lost, prevalence of SMEs in the informal sector. But when government talk about SMEs, you have to acknowledge, uh, in terms of the last question that was asked of us, they are certainly not talking about a business doing less than 15 million rand turnover. They're talking about businesses doing 18 million rand and above turnover. How we know that is the property industry group, when they talk about SMEs, they're talking about um, retailers doing more than 18 million rand. Linkages to the rest of the economy. And is it an enabling industry? Enabling government means, is it an industry which is creating more jobs? Is it an industry that is creating transformation? And that's why you've seen the small business and the tourism departments uh, implementing uh, relief schemes which are based on race rather than just on the nature of your business. So economic value at risk is critically important as a factor that government is taking into, play, into account. Then the transmission of risk, which is at nine point rating, and then economic stress. These are companies not presently operating, facing imminent retrenchment, facing imminent firm closure, facing permanent and irreversible damage, jobs at stake. So what government is saying is we have to take these three categories of factors into consideration, where we look at the risk of transmission, we look at the expected impact on the sector if the lockdown continues, and we look at the value of that sector to our economy. And then we will determine which of these sectors we are going to allow back into the economy in what order, because it might not necessarily only be in the factor of transmission of risks. So it might not only be that the number, the factor which is assigned to that industry in terms of the possibility of transmission of risk, that might not be the only factor which determines how quickly that industry is released back into the economy. It will be a combination of that factor plus how uh, uh, valuable is the eco that, e that industry or that sector to us and then finally, if we don't release it back into the sector, how many jobs are going to be lost and how many companies are going to be lost? It's, it's an art. It's not a science. And I would hate to have to be government having to make these decisions, I must say that.
Kerbis, yes, thank you for your question. General retail is not there, i.e. paint retail. It is there somewhere. We just haven't looked through it. Um, if we get a chance at the end of the presentation, then I'll go through it and I'll, I'll help locate it for you. Okay. Um, now, remember, sorry, I just need to say that. Uh, Kerbis, in answer to your question, remember that a lot of these are sectors, and those sectors have industries nested within them. So a lot of these are sectors. Uh, let me take one, for example, real estate activities could be um, uh, a Sotheby's, but could also be a cleaning company in the construct in the real estate sector, could be a management agent in the real estate sector, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole lot of industries nestled. And in answer to your question equally, Kerbis, it's also very much dependent on the system the DTI has, which has been created as a result of your association telling them that these are either correct six standard industrial classification or SOC standard occupational classification codes relating to the industry. So I hope I've illustrated that it's these factors as the transmission risk component and then the economic value and the economic stress which is taken into account to determine which industries get released back into the economy in what order. Uh, someone said to me, could you not be 100% wrong, Ivor? Could you not, I know when they use my name, by the way, they're going to come up with something outlandish. Could you not be 100% wrong? Could it not be that the president simply just releases all of the industries and sectors back into the economy at the same time? Now let's look at just very briefly um, what I call case studies. I want to look at Gauteng versus Limpopo, and then I want to look at, and Lee, this affects you, the post-lockdown exclusion industries, because I'm very sorry to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, but whereas these 29 industries are important, equally, in the scheme of what's important for the health of the country, there is now a definitive list of the industries that are just not important. Not important to government not important to the health of the country because of their uh, because of their risk factor, the transmission risk rating. So it's a normative curve that applies. And anyone who studies statistics will know that the normative curve has massively underperforming elements and massively overperforming elements. And if we're looking at risk as a normative curve, you can understand that there are some industries which are going to be classified as lockdown exclusion industries that are on the extreme right of that normative curve. It sounds like I'm running a statistics less lecture. I apologize for that, but I hope you understand that. Uh, Aggie, just very quickly, Aggie says the paint industry is linked to the chemical sector. Yes, it is, Aggie. And certainly it's nestled within the industrial chemical space of the chemical sector. So thank you for that. All right. So just very quickly, I'm not going to belabor this point. But as you can see here, we've got Gauteng on the left and we've got Limpopo on the right. And as you can see, I've played president here for a moment. God, I wouldn't want that job for the world. But I've played president to the extent that I've said that Gauteng as a province, and maybe within Gauteng, Joburg, Pretoria, Midrand, but not, I don't know, uh, Clarkstorp for argument's sake. But Gauteng is going to have this kind of a color, whatever color, to this level descriptor is attached eventually. Gauteng is going to have this yellowish, sort of orangish color. And that then means that the sectors permitted, the transport restrictions and the movement restrictions will apply to Gauteng. Limpopo, on the other hand, will very definitely have a level two blue color um, unless government acknowledges that the only reason it would be a blue is because we've just not managed to test anybody in that province or find people to be tested. Um, but I'm just using it as an example. So there's a level two versus a level four. Now, if you're premier of level two, if you're premier of Limpopo, and you have the competency and capacity to be premier, and I do need to stipulate that, but if you are premier of Limpopo, there is no way in hell that you will allow the army and that you will allow the police force to let anyone from Joburg or Pretoria or Midrand into Limpopo. Because you have no idea of the impact or the effect that a level four area is going to have in a level two area. But what you do know is if you take the risk of allowing cross-border pollination, your blue very quickly is going to become yellow. 
or orange or whatever that color is. So I, I know I'm sounding blasé and, and obstinate and rude, but I hope you understand this is what a Gauteng Premier and a Limpopo Premier are eventually going to be going to war about. Do I sacrifice my economy here? Do I sacrifice my economy to be able to have provincial harmony? That's essentially the question. Do I sacrifice my economy to have provincial harmony? And the permutations are nine squared, nine by nine. Those are the numbers of models that will need to be applied. Every province will need to make a decision about entry, exit of product, of people, of the supply chain process from nine different provinces into their province. I would imagine Gauteng and KZN and the Western Cape are going to be sitting there and saying, well, we've just got open borders. Whoever wants to come in can come in. Because from a herd infection perspective, they can only do us good. They can't really do us harm. But then again, remember, only 200 out of 58 million, 200,000 out of 58 million people have been tested. The vast majority who have been tested being in Gauteng, KZN and the Western Cape. So a lot of this is false statistical uh, 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 foundations upon which a lot of these assumptions, unfortunately, are having to be made at this stage. Okay, so that's that case study. Now for the bad news, and Lee, this is for you. The following restrictions are not going to be lifted, regardless of whether you are blue, green, yellow, or red. If you're a sit-down restaurant and you're a hotel, and you're not a hotel for, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, for uh, contamination groups. What's the word I'm looking for? I've forgotten it anyway, but you know what I'm saying. You're not one of those hotels. In other words, you haven't converted yourself into a containment facility. Those restaurants, sit-down restaurants and those hotels can kiss at least May, if not all the way through to December, goodbye. For obvious reasons. Either from an economic point of view, having a 50-seater rest restaurant or hotel that can only have gatherings of 10 people inside the workplace, 10 people outside of the workplace, which essentially would be in the restaurants and the hotels, that can only have a gathering of 10 people because the restaurant sector association hasn't negotiated a continuation of the 50-plus and they've certainly not negotiated uh, an increase of that 50 plus. So the only factor which at this stage would apply to them is this number 10. It, e economically, it's not necessarily possible. Bars and shabins are in the same category. Conference and convention centers, unless they're essential service conference and convention centers. Entertainment venues, including cinemas, theaters, and concerts, sporting events. Religious cultural social gatherings so your mosques your synagogues your churches are going to have to be virtual as a last case priority rather than a first case priority let me be gentle and say as a last case priority rather than the first case priority and i had a question here in fact i had a phone call as well this morning with exactly the same question was this um does government realize the effect that this lockdown and the continuation in some form or another of the lockdown is having on the non-governmental sector, the non-profit sector in South Africa. I think government definitely does. The question was, has government created um, aid and relief packages and schemes for that, those, those non-government organizations and those sectors? The answer is not at this stage, although a lot of those schemes do not restrict access from NGOs that have already been rolled out and will certainly be rolled out over the next week or two for the 500 billion. Um, but the NGO sector is not a priority sector for government, as you can well understand. So religious, cultural and social gatherings are, are very much included in that NGO NPO space. And so my answer to you is I do not anticipate that you are going to be a priority applicant on any of those supply side schemes, aids or relief schemes which are being released into the economy. Doesn't mean you'll be excluded from applying 
But at the same time, at the moment, there is no def defined scheme which has been created. Now, if you said to me, but what can we do if we're a synagogue or we're a church or we're a mosque? My answer would be speak to your association or join an association that can quickly create for you a national argument from churches, from mosques, from synagogues um, uh, 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 together as a collective that can go to the Department of Trade and Industry and say, you've created all these schemes, but you've forgotten us in the process. We insist on having some kind of an incentive aid and relief package available to us so that we don't disappear out of sight, so that when everything does come back to normal, because we're all level one provinces, we still have churches and synagogues and mosques for people to go to. So I'm saying to you, either get your associations to talk to each other and quickly create a confederation of those associations and then get to the doorstep of Ibrahim Patel, preferably wearing something very snazzy because he'll recognize you in good clothing because that's his sector. But get to Ibrahim Patel as quickly as possible and force him to create a, a relief and AIDS package for you that you can apply for as non-governmental sector organizations. Because, I mean, if you take it in context, if we're talking about a 500 billion rand incentive package that's been created, you're going to find one or two billion rand there for the NGO sector. And if the NGO sector is what has to work, just as associations have to work, has to work communities of people or communities of businesses or whatever it is, they must become important to government. But it's only if you've got a strong advocate arguing for them. Jacques says, can we get the video or YouTube link to this afterwards, please? Of course I will, Jacques. Of course I will publish it. Sorry, I know you guys have to go. We've lost about eight people from when we started. I do apologize because I know I am rambling. I'm nearly finished, ladies and gentlemen. But Lee, this was for your purposes to basically make you more depressed than you currently are, um, or rather more agitated and therefore activated to looking to integrate, Lee. And when I say integrate, if you're a restaurant, where do you integrate? Will you integrate into the online supply of cold foods at this moment in time because our minister of police has is on a rant and a rave against hot foods so cold foods number one you integrate there you also integrate in terms of potentially a mixed kind of a of an offering between online and uh, online uh, webinaring like uh, Jamie uh, Oliver has done uh, and at the same time, then also real tasting and, and deliveries, but you integrate. That's what I'm trying to say. But in integrating, you have to realize you put your chairs and your tables into storage and you do something else with your space. If your landlord won't give you a rent holiday or a rent discount or a rent deferral deferment, you cannot sit back depressed. You have to become agitated and you have to be moving now, Lee. You have to be moving into innovation to keep your business going in one way or another. Jenny, that would go for you in your business. You have already integrated. You Not only in the Cape Quarter do you have a restaurant, but you also have a school. And you also have a, 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 a very active um, on-television partner operating from India that I think you can be um, uh, benefiting from in terms of relationships, um, in terms of bringing the richness of food diversity back into South African homes, if not South African businesses. So there's so much to be done in terms of innovation. But I know many of you are so depressed that you're not in the space to innovate, but you don't have the luxury of, of remaining in that space for too long. I do need to say that. And I'm please, I'm not trying to pontificate. OK. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, you have to, have to, have to. Oh, I see my business has encroached into the insurance sector. I do apologize for that. I'm going to do this. Um, in summary, you have to, have to, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, bear the following in mind, please. From everything I've said, from these factors, the risk of transmission being assessed, the expected impact on the sector of the continued lockdown, how many jobs are going to be lost, how many businesses are going to go to the wall, and then the value of the sector to the economy, where is the next 500 billion rand going to come from if there are not companies out there that are surviving to be able to pay the tax and not employees on whose behalf PAY is being paid? Where is the value of that sector going to diminish gross domestic product in South Africa? So with all of that in place, you have to then say, 
I need to, what is my message to my landlord? Now, I'm going to borrow from previous webinars from this morning and, and the last week that I've been running with CITA, the South African Independent Tenants Association. But your message to your landlord is, it cannot be business as usual with what's contained in my lease agreement. And we're going to have to move towards a balanced risk. My risk, your risk in a partnership for the shop I'm renting, but of the center that I'm renting it in. Balanced risk that says the only fair way of charging me rent must be a percentage of my turnover. Because the turnover will determine whether or not I'm getting back on my feet. And I'm happy to pay a percentage of my turnover to you as my rent. But if I do not have turnover because your formula in your shopping center has gone down the tubes, you cannot expect me to pay rent. So your relationship with your landlord, critically important to yourself. Quite frankly, even if you are your own landlord. Because remember something. If at some stage you need to get under debt management, as a business, every contract you've entered into, including those contracts you've entered into with yourself, I own my business as Iva Blumenthal, I own my property as Iva Blumenthal, and my business arc consult uh, leases a, a, an office from that property uh, in the name of arc consult. That contract is going to have to be renegotiated and recontracted given these realities. What are these realities? Who are my customers? How are they going to get to me? How are they going to continue buy, to buy from me? Who are my suppliers? And which ones of those industries from, from number two all the way through to number 18? Who are my suppliers in terms of how they've been classified? And how is that going to impact on my supply chain? Number three, who are my clients in terms of me being in their supply chain? Am I going to be prohibited from getting product to them, being able to give them services? Can I convert product to services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? A critically important consideration. And then from an insurance company point of view, well, I'm going to say something now that is going to make three quarters of you really, really dislike me. But the more I speak about it and the more I think about it, the more I think that the insurance sector consciously de-risked themselves under the radar when they first found out about things like SARS, MERS, Ebola, HIV and AIDS. They have been systematically de-risking themselves without, at the very best, declaring it to the insurance brokers that have been selling you those policies, or at the very worst, in collusion with those insurance brokers. The insurance sector has a major culpability on their hands because as things stand at the moment, they are literally saying we have nothing to do with this pandemic. We didn't cover companies for this pandemic. We couldn't have foreseen the pandemic, and therefore there's no culpability. We wipe our hands of being responsible for this problem. So the profits that we have amassed are not going to be profits we're releasing to these companies in terms of helping them, in terms of business interruption. Your insurance brokers have either been ignorant, negligent, or worse, culpable in not forcing the hand of the companies offering those insurance policies. And so that's one factor. How we define force majeure, how we define supervening impossibility in terms of common law. But those are factors that are going to become more and more important in your business planning process. And importantly, the fact that your landlords knew long ago when they entered into a lease to exclude force majeure means that someone must have told your landlords, and in all likelihood, it was their insurance companies that said to them, we're not going to cover you for force majeure, so you better take force majeure or your culpability for force majeure out of the leases you enter into with your clients. And there's some clients who, who sign force majeure exclusion leases 10 years ago, 15 years ago, which means the insurance companies knew 10 years, 15 years ago that this problem, this pandemic was coming. They de-risked themselves, but they didn't tell you that your their client. They didn't tell you you weren't covered for these pandemics. And if they did it, they did it in a very surreptitious way. But I think there's a lot of culpability that insurance companies 
and, and, and property groups like SAPOA, like SA Rates, and the South African Shopping Center Association are going to have to be accounting to um, in terms of civil society going into the future. It's going to make the Truth Commission look like Mickey Mouse, not in terms of what they were covering, but in terms of the impact and what was the amount that was covered and the effect of what was covered. It's going to make the Truth Commission look like Mickey Mouse once this pandemic goes away and dies down, please God, in the next year or so. Insurance companies are going to be under the cosh. The landlord business associations are going to be under the cosh, and they're going to have to be made to pay because you have not got business interruption insurance in your businesses, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I know I'm grandstanding there. I do apologize for that. But the more and more I come across landlords de-risking themselves on that factor of force majeure, the more my blood boils on behalf of especially independent tenants out there who have been taken to the cleaners because of these landlords and these insurance companies. All right. I am now really, really sorry that we've gone so much over time. Can I ask any questions based on what I've covered so far? Are there any questions anyone would like me to, to clarify or give my opinion on um, at this moment in time? Hi, sir. However, yes, sir. Sorry, what's your first back name? Back to insurance. Sorry? What's your first name? Nathan. Nathan, okay, right. Yes, Nathan, what can I do for you, sir? Nathan, fine. Back to insurance company, disaster fund. Insurance companies are now not covered for the coronavirus sector, it's only to fire and, and floods. Is that possible or how do we handle that? I don't know. But Nathan, you've asked the question. And quite frankly, I think we're going to need to try and find out. And I can guarantee you that there will be some kind of an investigation. I'm sorry to sound so obtuse, but at this moment in time, I cannot comment only because I don't know. Um, any other questions? No, thanks. All right, I'm going to go to Adrian quickly. Adrian says, by when do you think sit-down restaurants will start recovering? Adrian, if, you, if I was to wager a guess, I would say that certainly May, June, and July will be out for sit-down restaurants. And then I imagine come July, maybe August, takeaways will be allowed, maybe even earlier because of the pressure on government, because of the fact that takeaways, the 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 industries that currently are operating, essential service industries, are absolutely dependent on having ac access to food because they're working. And yet they, they're no takeaways they can get food from. So it might become a priority industry, um, and it's a relatively low risk. But certainly sit-down restaurants, at least until August, I would guesstimate. And then, in a very controlled way, um, and like I say, the hope is that you would get to December and January as a normal trading pattern or season for sit-down restaurants, although we anticipate that the impact of the coronavirus on the restaurant sector will be felt at least for the first six months of 2021. I do need to say that. Um, and I, I'm going to try and elaborate on that uh, in our CITA webinars down, down the line. I hope I've answered your question, sir. Um, uh, the, 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 there was a question from Chris I glossed over. Chris says, Government will have to consider companies that will have expired or dated stock as a result of the lockdown. Well, very interesting, Chris. Government will have to consider that, yes, but so will your insurance companies. Because remember, they can apply force majeure the, the, or they can, they can exclude force majeure, but they cannot include a supervening impossibility for you to keep perishables stored and stocked when they can expire. It might very well be that government is forced if these business associations get their houses together. If, if you stop depending as business associations on Business South Africa and Business Unity South Africa, and you create a confederation of business associations that's worth something, it might very well be that they are able, on behalf of their clients, their member companies, and not politicians, as with BSA and BUSA, but it might very well be that they can put sufficient pressure on government to actually force government to force insurance companies to have to become responsible for not only business interruption, but more importantly, for perishable insurance. So I'm sorry, Chris, that's all I can say to you at this stage. Um, and Saki says, 
other than army enforcement, what other lockdown measures could be instituted to manage lockdown compliance areas that are not compliant uh, to the lockdown regulations? And so, okay, I, I need to say to you that even with two and a half thousand army people on the road, all the military, I mean, all the uh, South African police force on the road, there are still the majority of 58 million people in South Africa are still not complying because either they can't simply comply or because they're not complying. Um, and another 70,000 army personnel are not going to force compliance in the dark spaces, in the hidden spaces, in the spaces that the army can't get to and the police force can't get to, in those, in those shadows of communities where most of the non-compliance is taking place. I'm sounding like a, uh, one of these uh, authors, these fictional author writer, writers, um, fictional fiction writers. But the reality is that's unfortunately what I have to say to you there. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Why is the buck resting with government businesses? Why is the gov resting with the government? Businesses have a responsibility to manage and prepare for us. Of course they do. And business associations have a responsibility to drive businesses doing that. But that's not happening with competent business association representation at this moment in time. And I'm generalizing. There are some superb business leaders who work for business associations out there. But the vast majority are in sheltered employment, if you ask me. But that's just my view. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you for being on this call, on this webinar. Um, and I'm looking forward to tonight. I think I might pen an article tomorrow in response to what we hear from the president tonight. I hope I don't have false hopes and expectations and the president doesn't say I'm just forestalling any announcements until next week because I think next week will be too late given that the following week is when we have liftoff, <laughs> liftoff from lockdown. So thank you for that. Thank you all for participating and for, for staying online. I really appreciate that. I will make this webinar available to you as quickly as it has been processed um, on YouTube. So, so thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Stay safe. Travel safely.